Within six months of returning to work from maternity leave, I was fired for incompetence. Before moving on, let me pause to address your questions. Question one, did I sue? Well, after doing a cost-benefit analysis of the guaranteed investment, the subjective chances of success, and the likely tarnish to my professional reputation, no. No, I did not. Question two, was I incompetent? Yes. Yes, I was, as much as I hate to admit it. But it was less about my job, and it was more about something else, which I will tell you about. But first, and most importantly, question number three. Can this happen to you? I sincerely hope not. And just in case it helps make sure of that, I'm going to tell you what I wish I would have done differently for my entire life that might have sidestepped this situation completely. Because it was awful. The day I was fired, I went home to the house we just bought to accommodate the family. We had yet to make our first mortgage payment. I was living the American nightmare. I didn't even know if unemployment insurance covered incompetence as costs. At least in Massachusetts, thank goodness, it does. I worked hard at my job. It fit my skill set, and I loved it. So what went wrong? To help answer this question, let me back up a moment and talk about physics. I'm a scientist who's been studying, teaching, and working for the past 25 years, and this gives me the strong bias that the world is subject to the laws of physics. Physics is a way of describing the world, and at its very best, if you've got all of the relationships and variables defined correctly, it can be used to predict the future. Sometimes when we think of physics, we think of equations like E equals mc squared, or f equals ma, or f sub zero equals one over two pi, root g over l. We got it. <laughs> but we can also think of physics more visually. Here's a graph showing the distance that a motorcycle going at a flat 100 miles per hour can cover per unit time. So in one hour, it goes 100 miles. In five hours, it gets to Washington, D.C., and in just over three weeks, it can get to Buenos Aires. But what if the goal is to get to Argentina and we don't want to wait three weeks? Simple, go faster. Let's kick it up to 200 miles per hour. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> so what does this have to do with professional work? We're often told that in order to win at work, or at school, or at anything, really, we need to put in the time and effort. Want to get more out, we need to put more in. Simple, right? What could possibly go wrong? Well, that's not always the way things work. Let's take an, an example from physics. Resonant frequency. Resonant frequency is a property of certain machines, for example, spring or pendula, that work best when they get their inputs at specific periodic time intervals, not too fast and not too slow. We can think of this in the real world example of a pendulum pushing a kid on a swing. So the goal here is to get the kid going nice and high so that they're gonna have a really good time. And the way we do this is we start pushing. And then whenever the swing comes back, we push again. There's a rhythm to this, and once we get it, we can stop thinking about it, we can completely turn our bodies, we can have a conversation with the person next to us, and that kid's gonna go higher and higher, and we're not even breaking a sweat. Of course, we can push hard if we want to, but that is much less important than pushing every time, but only every time that the swing comes back. That rhythm is the swing's resonant frequency, and it doesn't depend on how high the swing is going or even how big a kid you've got on the swing. It depends only on the relationship between the length of the swing, so a fundamental property of the swing itself, and the force of gravity, a property of the swing's environment, in this case, Earth. What happens if you don't like the swing's resonant frequency? What if it's too fast for you? Well, you can skip a push or two. Maybe the kid's gonna get a little bored. There are some consequences. But on the other hand, what happens if you try to push faster than the swing comes back? 
at the very least, it's useless. You're trying to put energy into a system that is not available to receive it. But it could get worse. You can fall flat on your face. You can, uh, the swing can be coming at you while you're trying to push it away, and it can smack into you and hurt. It can be more disastrous to try to work too hard than to be a little lazy, but sensitive. The same thing will happen, though, if you're trying to work too slowly but not skipping entire swing cycles. If you are putting energy in at the wrong time, you are not getting the most you can out of the system. So again, what does this have to do with professional work? This is not a mathematical proof, but it is a solid math and physics-based system that might help shift your perspective. Let me invite you to remember a time when you wanted something, something that you thought you could achieve, so when you started working at it, you realized that the goal was um, more difficult than you had anticipated. So you worked harder, you put more in, and the more you worked, the more you put in, the farther away that goal seemed. If this has happened to you, you are not alone. There is a term for it, moving the goalposts. There's also physics that can describe it. Here's a graph of resonant frequency. See that peak? That's the goal. You reach the goal at resonant frequency. Now, out here to the left of the graph, where you're working at low frequency, which in physics translates to less work, you're not putting enough into the system to get the goal. And that makes sense to us. That's intuitive. That's not what we're arguing. Out here on the right, though, see that you've got a high frequency. That's more work. You've overshot your goal. You're still not reaching your goal, and the more you put in, the farther away the goal gets. It's like playing the price is right. You win the prize when you guess a price that's really close to the right answer, but once you overshoot, you lose. So this goal can be an achievement, a habit, a relationship. For me, I'm going to tell you about one when I was an undergraduate studying physical chemistry. Now, I love science, and I always have. But physical chemistry, that class was so hard for me. And I found myself uh, cramming for a midterm. I stayed up late into the night studying, uh, really stuffing information into my head. And then I got to the exam room, and I found this. Now, before I share with you the question, let me remind you that physical chemistry is a high-level science class. It has an awful lot of prerequisites. Not many people take it. So if this doesn't make sense to you, uh, you've got lots of company. It didn't make sense to me. Are you ready? Here goes. What common kitchen appliance makes use of microwave radiation? I was stumped. I knew there was a microwave part of the spectrum, but I didn't study it. Uh, and in my sleep-deprived state, I did not remember that microwave ovens work by stimulating the waters in your leftovers to heat them up. So that's not what I put down. What I put down was a 50-cent word that made it sound like I studied. Spectroscope. So don't be shy. How many of you, having studied less than I did on that exam, would have gotten more points on that question? Good job. Use that hand. Give yourself a pat on the back. You studied closer to that exam's resonant frequency. <laughs> As we speak, we are embarking on year three of the COVID-19 pandemic. And burnout, which has been growing for decades, is at an all-time high. Ashley Abramson's recent trends report in Monitor on Psychology shows a solid majority, as many as 79% of survey respondents, admitted to job-related stress last year. And the levels of physical fatigue were up 38% between 2019 and 2021. With the added stress of a global pandemic, the way we used to work may simply be beyond many people's functional capacity. There's also ample evidence in the literature that taking frequent breaks can be good for overall productivity in a variety of contexts. A 2012 study from Arizona State University shows a longer lasting benefit to blood pressure when exercisers complete three 10 minute workouts compared to one 30 minute workout in a day. 
Now, I was at Brandeis with a gig as a fitness instructor when this study came out and made a big splash in the fitness community. What happened to no pain, no gain? To powering through a tough workout? Could the benefit be in getting tired as opposed to being tired? Separately, a classic study from 1989 by psychologist Robert Boyce shows that new university professors who are restricted to writing in 30-minute time intervals had a greater publication record at the end of one year than their colleagues who are allowed to binge write whenever and for however long they want. So go ahead, knock on your professor's doors. If they seem busy, tell them you're here to help with their publication record. <laughs> None of this is to discount the power of psychological flow or deep creative work. But psychological flow, that feeling that time has no meaning because you are so immersed in your task, is difficult to create on demand. And for all of the bad publicity that task switching gets, there is a lot of evidence that stopping a task and coming back to it is at least as productive as trying to push through in one fell swoop. Now for all the numbers in science speak you just heard, resonance is a common word. And it's usually means to sig uh, it usually signifies a positive interaction between the internal and the external state. One of my favorite examples of this comes from Molly Bingaman, who is a personal stylist. And we don't often think of personal styling on the same continuum of uh, professions as science, yet she hits the nail on the head. The signature of authenticity is resonance. If you know who you are and you choose your look to reflect that, you can amplify your message without much effort. So how do you go about finding resonance? How do you get this positive interaction with the world? Well, there are two variables, you and everything else, and you have control over exactly one of them. In order to make all of this work, you need to know who you are. You need to recognize when you have energy and honor when you do not. You may know some things about your preferred patterns already. Maybe you're a morning person, maybe you're a night person, or you, like me, simply need to sleep more than society finds appropriate. But you are not a simple machine. You are not a spring or a pendulum. When things change in your world, you can react and adapt. You can even say no. Or if you're extra polite, no thank you. <laughs> My hope is that you are not only able to recognize your energy, your natural frequency, but also to detect when it changes and how well the world is harmonizing. I would also like to encourage you to think a little bit less about how far away you are from the goal and a little bit more about who you are and how your world resonates. Once you get that connection right, you just might find the goal taking care of itself. I was lucky. I lost a job, but I gained valuable time with my children. Now there are two of them. And I found wonderfully delightful creatures who don't think at all like me, who have extremely strong desires that sometimes I'm the only one who can fill. So I took what I knew about science to observe them and to really learn how to connect. I figured out what they wanted. I countered with what I needed from them in order to comply, and I was transparent and consistent with my limits now that I knew what they were. Then I found a new job, one that I also love. And I found I had colleagues who are wonderfully delightful creatures who don't think at all like me, uh, who have extremely strong desires that sometimes only I can fill. So I took what I learned by not working and out of habit, started treating my coworkers like toddlers. <laughs> I figured out what, I wa uh, what they wanted, I countered with what I needed from them to comply, and I was transparent and consistent with my limits now that I knew what they were. I worked less than I used to, and wouldn't you know it, I got promoted. Thank you. This is not to say that I have a protocol that anyone can follow if they agree with me that getting promoted is more fun than getting fired. But it is to say that I'm a different person than I used to be. When I started this talk, I told you I worked hard, I did everything, and I still wasn't getting the results that I wanted. Plus, I knew and wanted to disprove that common societal belief that new moms cannot 
work hard enough to make a significant contribution to the workforce. So before I left on maternity leave, I put more into my job than I had available. I arrived early. I left late. I always said yes. I did not waste the time prioritizing anything because I knew I would just do whatever it takes to get it all done. I hoped that the sum total of my productive output would be so great that it would give me a cushion of forgivability for when I came back and was adjusting to my life as a new mom. It didn't. What it did instead was to peg me as a swing that was always ready to be pushed, as somebody very much in tune to an outside frequency, but not to my own. What I wish I would have done instead was to advocate early for who I am and what I need to do my best work. That way, people would know what to expect, and those who can't work with me can get filtered out. If I am not willing to show up authentically and live within my own limits, which are defined by the laws of physics, then I'm setting myself up for failure in finding relationships that work at my resonant frequency. And to the outside world, that can look a lot like incompetence. Productivity, like resonant frequency, depends on the relationship between individuals and their environments. And it is my sincere hope that not only for your sake, but for the sake of the entire world, including me, that benefits from your best work, that you are able to find and work at your own resonant frequency. <laughs>